Good morning and welcome to our worship at St. Paul Lutheran Church and School and Merry Christmas and we have just celebrated the birth of our Savior and we continue hearing about all that he's done for us in our gospel reading today. As you celebrated Christmas, did you get what you asked for? Did you receive gifts from others? Are there, is there anything that you want to take back now? Mary and Joseph had an opportunity to take back or maybe better give back. Let's hear what God has to say about that in his word to us today. Let's sing.
the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son. My eyes have seen your salvation, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and for glory to your people, Israel. The nations shall see your righteousness, and all the kings your glory. You shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. Let's pray. We worship and praise your name, O God, for you have provided redemption for your people. To you belongs eternal praise. In you alone there is righteousness and strength. As you allowed Simeon's eyes in the temple to recognize your salvation, open our eyes so we can clearly see Christ today. In him, grant us peace in life and in death. Amen. today and all days for our Lord's humble birth, and to rejoice with the angelic hosts, the shepherds, and all who are witnesses to God's gift of salvation. In the midst of these joyous strains, we must also lay before our Heavenly Father the sin-filled lives we have grown, seeking His forgiveness and mercy. Let us therefore prepare our hearts and confess our sins to God our Father. We celebrate the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Yet even at this joyous time, we fall short of the life to which our Savior calls us. We are sinners who cannot save ourselves. We have been hard-hearted and unkind, proud, arrogant, and impatient. We have chosen to complain and hold on to grudges. We confess all our sin to you, those sins of which we are aware, and those that remain unknown. We ask you for your mercy and forgiveness, as you have graciously promised. Amen. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. You are no longer a slave, but a son. Salvation unto us has come. Jesus was born into the world to fulfill the Father's will, that the world would not be condemned by him, but saved. Therefore, as a called and ordained servant of the word, I announce the grace of God to all of you. In the place of my Lord Jesus Christ and by his command, I forgive you for all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Let's pray. Oh God, our maker and redeemer, you wonderfully created us and in the incarnation of your son, yet more wondrously restored our human nature. Grant that we may ever be alive in him who made himself to be like us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before all the nations. A reading from the 61st and the 62nd chapter of the Old Testament prophet Isaiah. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its sprouts, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to sprout up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before all the nations. For Zion's sake I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not be quiet, until her righteousness goes forth as brightness, and her salvation as a burning torch. The nations shall see your righteousness, and all the kings your glory. And you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hands of the Lord, and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken, and your land shall no more be termed desolate. But you shall be called, My delight is in her, and your land married. For the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle reading for this morning is Galatians 4, 4-7. When the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so you no longer are a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God. This is the word of the Lord.
Our gospel reading for this morning comes from Luke chapter 2. When the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary brought Jesus up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher, she was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. And when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We join our voices together as we confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for us to think about on this first Sunday after Christmas is our gospel lesson from Luke chapter 2. At verse 22, when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought Jesus up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. So the, the great procession has begun. It's like the, t- the turn of the tide. What was this big flood in one direction is now becoming a big flood in the other direction. Do you realize that over the Christmas season this year, there were more than three billion packages delivered in the United States. Three billion packages, which is more than 10 packages for every man, woman, and child in America. That's, that's a lot of packages. And now they're turning around and going the other direction. All those UPS trucks, all those Amazon Smile trucks, all those uh, postal service trucks and FedEx that went out with things, now they're turning around and they're going back with more packages. According to the retail, let's see, the, the National Retail Federation, they did a survey. And 77% of you said that you intended, you figured you would be returning at least one gift. 20% of you said you would expect to return more than half of the gifts that you received. Imagine that. So they say last year you returned $100 billion worth of gifts. $100 billion worth of gifts were returned back to the stores and warehouses that they came from. And then, and then you went through that process, you know, the kind of the unpleasant process of returning a gift. You, you have to make sure you get all the parts and pieces and you put it back in its original packaging somehow. And you have to make sure you have the receipt. And is there a special form? Because from each company you bought things from, it's something different. So the receipt and fill out the form and print the mailing label and get it all in the box and make sure you have everything and then you take it to the place to ship it or maybe you take it back to the store, you drive there, you wait in a long, long line of people who are returning things and you go and you explain, you know, you're returning this, you want your money back. Uh, it's, it is tiresome, isn't it? And kind of unpleasant. And then, did you realize that when you, when you get it back and it's put on a truck and it's shipped back to the warehouse or the factory or whatever it is, it gets back there, somebody has to receive it and make note of that and do the paperwork and unpack it and check it all out. And for some things to be restored or fixed up, maybe clothing has to be uh, cleaned or pressed and repackaged and refolded and repackaged and made ready for a new customer to buy it. And in many businesses, that costs so much to do that, just to restock the item that, that they don't bother. They put it on another truck and it goes to a landfill. So last year, five billion tons of Christmas gifts after Christmas went to the dump. They were put in, put in a landfill. That's painful. Think of all that work, all the work of the people who manufactured these things, who, the people who transported them, people who put them up for sale. Then you went and you searched for the right thing and you paid money for it and you bought it and it was shipped and you received it and you wrapped it and you gave it and it was unwrapped and there was excitement and then it was put back in the wrapping and then all the process of returning and back to the factory or the warehouse and then off to, off to the dump. All of that wasted. And we do that because it was the wrong size, it was the wrong color, it, was, it didn't make you look good as you maybe thought it would. Um, you really would have rather gotten something else and so you send it back to get something different. What if, what if, as unpleasant as that is, what if you have to return a gift? What if you have to take something back that you really wanted and you want to keep it? But you have to go through this process of sending it back. Some retailers have told me that every year they see this. There are some you know, parents or, or, or 
people who, who love somebody, they want to give somebody a nice gift, and they can't afford it. And so they buy a gift on credit, usually, usually electronics or games or that sort of thing. And then, and then they wrap it and they give it and it's enjoyed for a week or two, maybe for the length of the Christmas break, and then they, they have to send it back because they can't afford it. Before the credit card comes due, they, they have to send it back and get that off their bill. That would really be sad, wouldn't it? To have to return a gift because it's not really yours. And so we come to Mary and Joseph. This is Mary and Joseph. After Christmas and after all the excitement, the new baby and the angels and the shepherds and the neighbors, and now they have to take their gift back because it's not theirs. And they go through a similar process. They have the original packaging. That would be Mary. They don't have a receipt, but they, they make the journey. They they hike six miles from Bethlehem to Jerusalem, and they wait in a long line at the temple to return Jesus. Did you realize that? It all starts in Exodus, in, in chapter 13 of Exodus, where we read, uh, God has brought the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt, and they're in the wilderness, and the Lord is explaining to them what's going to happen as they're going to go to the land that he has promised them. And he says, When the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, as he swore to you and your fathers, and shall give it to you, then you shall set apart to the Lord all that first opens the womb. All the firstborn of your animals that are males shall be the Lord's. Every firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb, or if you will not redeem it, you shall break its neck. Every firstborn of man among your sons you shall redeem. And when in time your son asks you, what does this mean? You say to him, by a strong hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. For when Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, the Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of animals. Therefore, I sacrifice to the Lord all the males that first opened the womb, but all the firstborn of my sons I redeem. God's children were enslaved in Egypt, and they cried out, and he, ironically, delivered them like a, like a UPS man, like an Amazon smile truck. He took them out of Egypt, and he delivered them to the promised land. But... There was an important lesson for them and for us to learn that, that God desired them to learn from this. He needed them to know freedom costs something. Someone has to pay. When God visited ten plagues upon Egypt. It wasn't just because he was angry. It wasn't just a punishment for them. It wasn't even just to show that God was more powerful than the Egyptian gods, as, the, as he demonstrated each of those plagues. It was to show the price of life, the price of slavery. God paid a price for his people. He took the lives of the firstborn males of the Egyptians, the heirs, in exchange for his own children, his heirs. He bought his children back at the price of the Egyptians, whom he also had created, who were also his own children, and whom he also loved, but who had rejected him. God bought his children back at a great price. And then he wanted the Israelites to understand that price, to understand what he had done and to remember it. And so he commanded them, every firstborn male, he said, belongs to me, belongs to, to God. The donkey, he says, Congratulations, your donkey has had a, a foal, and, and you have a new uh, valuable addition to your family, but it belongs to me. It's not yours. 
And so you can either buy it back, redeem it with another life, the sacrifice of a lamb, or you can kill it, but you can't keep it. It belongs to me. And your son, congratulations, it's a boy, and it's your heir, it's the firstborn. But he's not yours. He belongs to me, God says. And you need to remember that, and so you will redeem him. You'll buy him back with a lamb sacrificed in his place. Or if you can't afford that, God says, if a, if a couple is poor, they could sacrifice a couple of turtle doves or a pair of pigeons instead. The child that you hold in your hand on this happy, joyful day has to be returned, has to be bought back because it belongs to God. And you must purchase it back if you wish to keep it. And so Mary and Joseph find themselves in the long return line, in the line at the temple. Their baby does not belong to them. They, they must buy him back a life for a life. And so they purchase two birds, uh, turtle doves or pigeons, and they wait in line. And when it is their turn at the temple, they give their offering, their, their, their little cage with the birds, to the priest. And the priest kills them there in front of the altar. And then Jesus is theirs, right? Now, at last, he belongs to them, and they can take him home. Or does he? <laughs> Maybe they should have sacrificed the lamb. This is, this is such a dark shadow. They, they now have Jesus as their own. He's been redeemed back, but as they go, a man comes up, a nice old man, Simeon, and he says a wonderful hymn of praise to God. But he says, instead of saying, what a cute baby, he looks just like his mother. No, he says, this child will be opposed and a sword will pierce your own soul. And Anna, this nice old lady who spends all her time in church, all her time at the temple, she says, this child is the redemption of Israel. Did you get that? It's not just, wow, this is happy, this child is the redemption of Israel. No, this child is the redemption price, the price that will be paid for the people of Israel. Not a lamb, not a bird, a little boy, their son, he will be the price paid to buy you back, to buy you back from slavery to sin. Mary and Joseph could keep him for a little while, but at last, he would have to be returned. When Jesus begins his ministry with his baptism, John cries out, look, it's the Lamb of God. And the people who were listening to him, they knew what that meant perhaps better than we do. God was going to make a great exchange once again because his children whom he loved were still enslaved. They were still in sin. And he loved them enough to buy them back. And so he was going to return a great gift. Did you enjoy giving and receiving gifts this Christmas? It's wonderful. We say that it's a reminder of the wise men's gifts, don't we? Gold and frankincense and myrrh. And so it is. Frankincense and myrrh are, are spices, are perfumes that are used at funerals for burials. And of course, our own gifts are not perfect gifts either. Never quite right. So we may return some of them. But now you know, even the returned gifts are a reminder that your life does not belong to you. You were bought at a price, not gold or silver, 
the holy, precious blood and the innocent suffering and death of God's only Son. From your slavery, from your sin, you were bought back and not, not taken to the dump like all those rejected gifts. You were bought back by your Heavenly Father at the ultimate price of His Son. Merry Christmas. The shadow of the cross falls across the cradle, but it is a shadow of your salvation, the greatest gift that you could receive. Amen. And now may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Lord God, in the fullness of time, you sent forth your Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem us and give us the adoption as your children and heirs. Hear us, Father, as we call to you in Jesus' name. Give us grace to rejoice in his incarnation and give us a glad new year. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, this past year is one that we wouldn't have chosen. In many ways, we have seen the disastrous effects of our sin. We've also seen your mercy and grace along the way. We pray that you would fill us with faith as we look back at the end of one year and look forward to your work through us in another. Give us joy in the opportunities we will have to work in your kingdom. And lead us to selflessly serve in your name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, open our eyes to see your salvation for your whole creation. Stir our hearts by your Holy Spirit that we would support the mission of your church. And as we share your love and truth, use us to encourage sons and daughters to consider your call to serve as called servants in your church. And lead us and giving sacrificially to provide for the work of proclaiming Christ to the nations. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, bless all families. and Remind them of your promises. Give parents diligence and delight in their work. And we pray that you would give your favor to all children, that they would grow in strength and wisdom. Bless all singles, widows, orphans, and broken families also with your mercy, and give them joy in the redemption you have won for us in Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious Lord, hear our prayers for those who suffer from loneliness. Comfort them with the sure and certain knowledge that they will never be forsaken by you. 
Give them family and friends within the household of faith with whom they can find loving companionship. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, help the sick and the suffering, especially those who desire our prayers. We pray for those with cancer, Don, Carol, Nola, Jerry, Greg, and Ed, and Jeremiah, and Debbie. We pray for many with COVID-19, Julian, Renee, and Juan, Jim, Grace, Kenzie, and Martin, Carolyn, Dolores, and Sarah. Lord, continue to look upon them with compassion. We pray for Barb's upcoming surgery, that you would be with all those who attend to her. And we thank you for successful sur surgeries for Daniel and Roger and Harvey. Continue to heal them, Lord. We pray for Kay, who's in the hospital still and will be going to rehab soon. We pray for others who are recovering and healing. Joan, Ruth, Oliver, Trudy, Tom, Carol, and Susan, and Penny. We ask that you would continue to look upon Sally and Jim and Mike, Leonard and Anne, and all their needs. Lord, surround them with your love in Christ. Heal them according to your gracious will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for our congregation as we remember those who have been part of our body of Christ and are now in Jesus' presence. Comfort all who mourn today, all who have lost loved ones in this past year. We pray especially today for the family of Arlene Harvey. God, as we grieve for the lives lost in our congregation, in our families, in our lives, Give us hope, strength, comfort in the name of Jesus, the Prince of Peace. May we always trust in his promises of resurrection life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, into your hands we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord, who has also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.
Wait, sorry, what are we, which one are we on? Oh Jesus, so sweet. What's the number? 368. No, we're, no, 546. 546. Got it. Yeah, this is an American. <laughs> <laughs> it's American? Oh yeah. Good. We need fireworks and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Getting hyper efficient. This says it only has 26 seconds left of recording. Uh, <laughs> how is that possible? I don't know. Do you want to see what happens in 26 seconds? It's not going down. It's. Oh, now it's flashing. It's flashing 10 oh, more 